struggles might be and trying to help them kind of find their path in that, even if it was only during kind of school years. But mine kind of really took root. And when they sent me to the opera, I kind of very easily found my place there. I auditioned at seven. I got in. I trained for a few months. And I mean, I was on stage within a matter of weeks in non-singing roles. And then months later, I, I had, you know, learned all these songs and parts uh, in other languages that I had no idea what I was singing about, but I just learned them phonetically. And I got to put on great costumes and go out on stage every night. And it was really magical. And that's how it started. Um, and then my first um, acting gig, um, I was also interested in, in, in performing. And, and weirdly, there was, a, there was a slight sexism that existed even within the children at the opera. Boys were always... Um, prioritized in casting solos over girls. And that frustrated me. And I knew that in an acting lane or even in a theater lane, um, that there were roles that were specifically written for girls, young girls. And so I started kind of taking some acting classes with the coach that I, I was a really big Friends fan. And I, I had heard Matt LeBlanc, who I thought was just a brilliant comic, talk about his acting teacher in interviews. And when I was about 10 or 11, I remember thinking like, well, I got to study with that coach because he's really funny. Um, and so I found this coach and she became one of my closest friends and mentors. And there was a movie that was casting and they happened to ask this coach, do you have any young girls that can sing? And she had given my name and they had gone to the opera and they said, do you have any young girls who can act? And they said, they had given my name. And so the casting director for this movie had gotten my name and called me in for an audition. I got the part and I, the movie went to Sundance and then I had some big age. So it, it kind of happened naturally, but also because I never really felt like I fit in, in the normal world. I, I always existed better if there was like costumes and huge elephants shitting on stage, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> So let me ask you, because it's said in your bio that when you auditioned for your role in Phantom of the Opera, you came in full costume and makeup. And the conventional wisdom says that you should not show up in full costume, um, you know, for your audition, only touches of it. But it did work for you. So what is your opinion about that? Well, firstly, that's not totally accurate. I, I did not show up. They put, in fact, for the screen test for Phantom, there were like six or seven girls. And I was only brought into the kind of audition pool about two days before the screen test. So they were at the very end of the process. And I had heard about it and gotten the audition super, super late. And so I was kind of like tapped on. I was the last audition of the of the day, and I kind of figured that I was in last place. Um, and so when I showed up, I had been told that it was a screen test, and they would be putting us in costume and hair and makeup, and it was this big production. I have certainly never showed up in full costume or hair and makeup, but I do think that that could work. Um, I've never done it. I've always tried to, like you suggested, go for like little touches of something. If it's a period piece, kind of thinking about a, a kind of softened version of what a period hairdo would look like, or, you know, taking out any kind of double piercings I have in my ears, little touches that can kind of give, give an eye towards that. But I think inherently the audition process is very challenging because even though I love it, um, and still audition all the time. I'm like a junkie for auditioning. It's, it's, it's like a, it's a, um, it's very masochistic, I think, but I don't know. I've always found that like, in order to really master a character, you have to live with it in your body and walk the streets and think about what it's like to really exist in the world as this person with their story and, and their posture and their way of speaking and being. And it's so hard to master that in, when I had 48, 72 hours, sometimes a week before an audition. So auditioning is inherently, it's really challenging. It is. But for some people, it's the only way to act. And I hear sometimes actors saying, well, I love acting, but I, lo I don't like auditioning. But auditioning is acting. If they just change their mind about that, you know. 
So this is very good advice, basically, for people, not just to read the sides, but to try to inhabit the character and live with it a little bit and, you know, make a choice. The question is, can you actually gather the character from the little sides that you have? Because it's one thing to read a script and get a character, and the other one is actually to get those sides, and they just feel like it's, you know, a tiny, tiny little piece of the puzzle. So I'm curious about how, what your preparation would be just with sides. Well, I definitely had many years where I just went off sides. In fact, I remember that I only had the sides for Mystic River. I did not have the whole script when I auditioned for it. And in fact, they had asked me to audition for the role that actually went to Ari Grainer, the role that was the friend of, I think the character's name was Katie Markham, the girl that died that I ended up playing. And when I read those sides, I knew that the log line was about the daughter that died. And I just didn't connect to that character. And I knew there was this other character. So I asked my agent, do you have the sides to the other character? Do you think they'd see me for that? And she said, they really don't think you're right for it. But if you really want to, I mean, they'll put you on tape for it. And I think that you always have to find your way in, your connection to it. Um, and I guess I made a lucky bet on that one. But I've also... I mean, I've had situations where I had the whole script and a Bible and I, th and I still didn't nail it. I think sometimes the director is really looking for something very specific. I mean, sometimes they're looking to cast their, like, what reminds them of their ex-wife, right? Or their daughter. or And there's so nothing really you can be, right? And so everyone has a natural inherent energy. And you can try to change that when you walk into the room, but it's hard. It's hard. But, but I think, yeah, yeah. no, no, I think that my, 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 my thought about auditioning and why it doesn't make me feel defeated, even when I don't get the part, because you more often do not get the part than you do get the part. That's just, it's, you just got to play the odds, right? Is that I feel that as long as I hook into something, find a, a character, that even if I don't get to play that character, that character's in my back pocket. I can use it again for something else. Even if the lines aren't the same and the situation isn't the same, it's the same kind of energy. And sometimes when I play characters, now I'll think, okay, so it's a little bit of the physicality of this one, but it's a little bit of the, the mentality of this one. And maybe she gets angry like this, but maybe she gets hurt like that. And maybe, maybe this is new. I haven't done this mode before. So I feel like it's kind of like a suitcase of experiences when you're doing that performance in that audition, even if it's a self tape or whatever, that I've always found beneficial somehow. Um, I remember I auditioned for a film that just came out this year and I worked so hard on the audition. This audition was years ago. And the actress that ended up getting the role um, did a beautiful job and played it totally different than I had envisioned it. But I still remember the fragility and the, the brokenness that I found in that. And I haven't gotten to use that again yet, but I know that I will. And so I remember what that felt like, and I can recall that and bring that up if I need that again. I think this is brilliant, really. And I, who was sitting many times across the desk, you know, totally agree with you because... The casting can be very subjective. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with it ultimately. But if you commit to a part, we can see that you committed to it, even if it's the wrong interpretation. Right. And people make a mental note. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The director, the casting director, they make a mental note and say, okay, maybe not for this one, but this person really commits to something. Uh -huh. Right. And 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 um, we want to bring it back for other stuff. Yeah, and I think wishy washy. If you wishy washy and you're trying to really guess what everybody really meant or wanted or something, totally. it comes out that way. You know? I've auditioned for Darren Aronofsky and not gotten the part three or four times, <laughs> and he keeps calling me back. So I feel like I don't totally suck, right? Like he must be like someday it'll work. Um, <laughs> 
And I auditioned like once or twice for Scorsese and, and it did, well, got it once, but couldn't do it and then didn't get it the other time. So I feel, I feel okay about, about those things. And honestly, sometimes just like being in the room with those people, it's, that's pretty, it's pretty exciting just to be like, okay, I got here. Even if I don't get on set, like I got here. So that's cool. Right. And are you okay with the fact that, um, you have to audition for them. Audition doesn't mean that you read or you just come for a meeting with the big directors. Like in both of those situations, it was reading. Um, usually, if it's a, I think if it's a prominent director, uh, d- different people have, some people don't want to see you read at all. Some people like yes. don't even care about the read and they don't really believe in acting and they just want to meet you because they think you're just going to play yourself. Um, some people only want to see tape. Clint, Clint Eastwood never meets actors in person. He only wants to see the audition tape. He just doesn't doesn't do in person auditions. Um, and then there Is are that Clint that... Eastwood. Did you say? Mm-hmm. But really? Um, mm-hmm. I think he doesn't maybe want to be swayed by how he feels about the person in person. He just wants to watch the performance, like as a as an audience member. And then there are occasions where I no longer have to read. If um, it's similar to something I've done before, or it's a relationship that I have with somebody that knows what I what I can do, what I'm capable of, um, but it just every situation is different. But okay. I, I I'm not I'm not scared to audition. Sometimes I actually get more nervous if I get the part having not read because I get very nervous for the table read thinking, oh God, this is the first time you're gonna see me do it. What if you hate it? People get fired at table reads. So I've never been fired at a table read yet, but I get very nervous for the table read uh, because I think, oh God, if I didn't audition, you're about to see what you bought and what if you don't like it? Yeah, interesting. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Angeline which, of course, you produce and starred in brilliantly, I might add, because it was compelling and it was entertaining at the same time. I have to say that I lived here when all those billboards went up. And after a while, you were like, who is she? And what's with those billboards? Because there was no... There's no name of movie. There was no name. You know, it was just a puzzle. And so how and why were you drawn to it? You know, I think after so many years of doing Shameless, which started to feel so comfortable, um, I, I started to feel like I really needed to be scared again and to wonder that feeling of, oh my God, I don't know if I can do this. I might fail, but I'm going to work so hard because this is so worth it. Um, and I feel something here that is that was drawing me and compelling me to the story. Um, when I, I, I grew up kind of auditioning in LA from the time after I got signed by that agent, came out to LA. When I was about 13 or 14, I first saw the billboards and I had a similar kind of experience like who who is this person um and she was always just kind of like LA's unicorn and this person that seemed just like famous for being famous and I wasn't sure kind of who she was or what what she represented and there was a lot of mystery behind who she really was and what her real name might be what her real age might be but there was always this sense of kind of like joy mystery fantasy around how people held her in their hearts, mostly. I mean, some people thought she was a joke and I thought that that was also really interesting, um, how judgmental people could be of this woman who had really made herself. And then in 2017, I was sitting on the side of the set kind of just scrolling Twitter and the Hollywood Reporter released an article um, claiming to reveal her true backstory. And her response to this article was even more fascinating because she denied everything, but then wouldn't say what was not true because she said she liked the sympathy and the empathy and the fame she was getting. So it was this whole dog is barking. Um, 
So it was this real, but the, the story that they, that they revealed, which didn't seem like it was her truth, but might have been a truth, was so poignant and moving. And it made me think a lot about the different stories that we tell ourselves, the stories that we tell, the way in which we appropriate women's stories, um, the way we co-opt people's narratives. And it became, it just buried into my heart, especially as a Jewish woman, the story of uh, a woman who was the daughter of Holocaust survivors, potentially being her backstory this character that she created, one that strove for complete joy and and a complete um, rejection of any kind of negativity or heaviness, that kind of being a, a big fear. There was a lot of complexity suddenly there. And for me, I thought it was a really interesting way to kind of tackle our addiction to fame, our addiction to like doxing people. And of course I wanted to tell the story, but did not want to be part of the problem and really wanted her involvement. So then, you know, getting the rights to the article and then the next couple years before we got the green light to the show, getting her to kind of um, agree to be part of it and um, to, to option her life rights. It was a real process. Yes. Um, the... I think what struck us most is about about her is her really um, utter confidence in her vision and her belief, which of course got people, although mostly men, I would say, to be totally devoted to her. Yeah, and I have to confess, it's like when she ordered. Um, sliced tomatoes and salt for salad. I said, oh, what a good idea. And I did it the next day. <laughs> so, <laughs> Influencer. So, absolutely. And so, but my question to you is, do you think that that confidence came about from her spirituality, which was, you know, in essence, if you manifest it, the universe will provide, and therefore, what's there to fear? it's all going to happen. Yeah. I feel like in a way in which at the birth of this character, right? Because she was born as a person with a different name and at the birth of this character, maybe at first it was something that she tried on. And then I think she always inside knew that's who she was. And I think that transition and commitment became more and more um, solidified as she kind of grew in power and aged. And now I really do feel that there is, that it is true that other person does not exist. Um, I, 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 we spoke about spirituality, about Alan Watts, about kind of 60s L.A. hippie philosophy, about the um, spiritualism center that's in the Palisades, which is a place uh, where all the religions exist around this weird, like, Hollywood set um, uh, lake. It's called, um, it's called Lake Shrine. Um, and there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. A, there's Judaism, Christianity, Catholicism, Buddhism, Hinduism, and they all kind of have a seat around the lake. And that's a place that she really loves and feels connected to. And so I think there is a little bit of this kind of manifesting, um, and like a little bit of, um, just a little bit of magic and witchiness. Like, I think there is just a little bit of kind of spell casting and, and she's pretty, um, She's pretty hypnotizing when you're with her. Um, sure. it, it, I mean, it clearly worked on me because I, you know, devoted years of my life to telling this story, um, which will never be her story. Only she can tell that. It's it's my version of what touched me about her. And that's kind of what I think is so interesting about what an icon is. They kind yeah. of... It's a cert yeah. At a certain point, I was like thinking about inventing Anna, and also she had a vision and, and um, you know, confidence, except she was really a con woman. And, you know, Angeline was actually a sweet person. 
mm-hmm. you know, really kind of wanted to do good in the world and believed in, you know, that magical place that maybe we can all reach. So there was thing. Okay, I'm going to ask a last question and then I'll just go to the student. I just wanted to say that your performance of Angeline was mesmerizing. And it was not only because uh, the physical transformation, but because you kind of let us in to the essence of her as much as she allows it, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you really start feeling for her. And um, I just wanted to, what did you think was the most important thing to convey about her in the series, in portraying her? Um, The complex nature of the need for control, that when you have been Um, really through the ringer as a child, experienced loss and fear and terror in the way that um, our version of her did. Um, That that need to control your destiny, your future, your life is about survival. Um, That that need to, to be loved, to be validated, to be adored, and to be perceived as perfect, to not have any imperfections, that complete rejection of any negativity as part of your sphere, that there could be any blemishes that could be lovable is not something that is possible. And so there was that complete commitment to like Barbie and control um, that I found very kind of complex and really poignant. in the way in which she kind of surrounds herself and, and, and really with people that she trusts and seemingly like can lord over everyone in this kind of like two dimensional way in which she can receive the love that she so desperately wants and, and needs to like, to be alive. The adoration. Yeah. I think that was, I mean, it's, it's incredibly complex and, and to be able to play somebody who goes through that that kind of physical transformation as well, continually changing themselves surgically and the way that that manifests in the body. Um, and the, the voice also, I thought, was the most interesting part. Um, the kind of modalities in which her voice exists and how she goes from kind of business voice to baby doll voice, depending upon what she needs and wants in that moment. Um, and sometimes kind of hardly ever drops it. Um, so it, it, it was, it was really, really interesting to see that and also to, to speak with her and also lots of people that have known her. Yeah, it was very compelling. And the more you got into it, the more complex and interesting because every episode was different and added to the puzzle. Okay. Let's open up for the students because it's really for them. So, uh, Mike, do we have anybody? Toby, yes, we have a question from Elise Lantournier. Elise, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Emmy? Hi, Emmy, I'm Elise. Hi. <laughs> um, I was going to ask you what is your favorite way of like decompressing with all the stresses that come with um, being an actor? And also, what are like the best mindsets that you've learned along the way? Um, crying is a good one. I'm not even kidding. I'm not even kidding. I think that crying or screaming into a pillow, um, I could say meditating, but honestly, sometimes at the end of the day, or sometimes I, when I'm on my way home, I'll just listen to like really trash top 40 music and like, just really sing, you know, like whatever old pop song. Um, I think anything that gets you or a shower, anything that gets you back into your body, your body, not the body that you just, you know, existed in all day. Um, but I think it's hard. Um, anything that helps you kind of, and sometimes I just watch like comforting TV, um, something that'll take you out of it. Um, sometimes I'm too tired and I just want to play like the wordle on my phone or do the crossword puzzle with my phone. Um, 
<laughs> and sometimes I literally just can't speak to anyone at the end of the day. I just have to come home and like, just hold my dog. Like, and some days I feel totally fine. And like, I'm able to like leave work and like go to a birthday dinner. Like it just totally depends on, um, the day. And what was, sorry, what was your other question? Oh yeah, no worries. Um, what is, what are some of the best mindsets that you've learned to pick up along the way? Mindsets, you mean like guiding principles or? Uh, yeah, just really anything that you feel like is best to live by as an actor, as a woman in the business, anything like that. Um, my coach will say, uh, don't work so hard. <laughs> um, uh, my mom likes to say, stay focused and have fun, which I think is really key because I think you know, you want to prep, but then when you're there, you want to have fun in whatever, in whatever way that means, like kind of being present and being there. Um, and then I think it's really important to, to find the women on the set that are your, um, partners that, that are your allies and, um, and let them watch out for you and watch out for them too. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we have another question here. This one's from Ashley Vinay Salas. Um, Ashley, we've been able to unmute yourself. What is your question for Emmy? Hi, I just want to say that I'm so happy to be here. I'm such a, a huge fan of you and your work. And I want to know what was the hardest part of being in the project like the Phantom of the Opera. And the second question is, do you think there's a limitation or an obstacle of being in the performing arts for a person with a disability? I'll start with your second question. I think more than ever, the world is opening up um, and the roles that might have been appropriated by um, women like me will go to women that deserve those roles and know those lives better than, than me. Um, I still think that those stories are underfunded and undertold, but, um, I do think there's progress being made in that direction. And I think that this, that the scales are being righted now, um, and the right people are being cast. And I think that casting directors are galvanized to go find the right person that is right for that role. Um, um, and the hardest part of Phantom was probably the pressure of knowing how many people had seen that and how many people had a preconceived notion of what that character should be and also feeling so young and so like I did not know what I was doing and I was 17 and terrified every single day. Like just really just quaking in my boots, like so terrified, terrified to sing, terrified to breathe, terrified to act, just, just really scared the whole time. I was definitely focused, but I was not having fun. If I got the chance to do it again or make another musical, I would have so much more fun now knowing what an, an incredible opportunity that was. I, I think I didn't have enough fun. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have another question here. Uh, this one is uh, comes in from Jimena Guzman. Uh, Jimena, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Emmy? Hello, well, thank you so much for having me here. Um, I was wondering, out of all the characters you have played in film or theater, which character did you connect to the most? I don't think I can pick one. Um, it's so interesting because I, I think sometimes the characters that are the least like you, you have to work hardest to connect to. And so those are the ones where you learn the most about yourself. Um, I think probably with Fiona, where I played on Shameless for so many years, the, the connection to her became so familiar almost like I had had a roommate for nine years, truly like a roommate in my body six months a year that I 
that I really feel a, a deep connection to that and actually have found her like showing up in me sometimes. And I'm like, no, 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 that's not you. Um, like, you don't need to get into that fight. So, so it's really funny how there's that kind of osmosis that happens. And then I just played a character on a show um, for Apple that comes out next year. And that was an incredibly challenging character that was very different from me and really with a lot of like deep seated trauma. And I, I found it really hard to be in that character's body, but I also found that I learned so much about finding empathy for people that are different from you that I, I thought it was really interesting. Thank you. We have a question here from Daria Svenger from our South Beach campus. Daria, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Emmy? Awesome. Hi, Emmy. Tova, Hi. thank you so much for all the questions <laughs> as well. I've been loving this Q&A so far. Uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned that it's normal to feel scared and terrified when you're just starting out and you felt and shared the, these emotions. So I'm definitely resonating with that. And the question is, uh, how did you find out which characters you were meant to play when you transitioned from theater to film? I think it's just the parts you get are the ones you're meant to play. Um, although I have felt like, gosh, I was really meant to play that and I wish I'd gotten that chance and I didn't. Um, I think that you, the more that you audition, the more that you act, you learn what you're good at and what you can do with ease. And I think the trick is to keep challenging yourself and not just to easily revert into that pattern of, oh, this is how I do this feeling, or this is how I do this. So almost like, you know, you can get really into the habit of like having the same breakfast every day. I think it's really important with acting to, to challenge yourself to find different ways to approach something if the character really calls for it. Awesome, awesome. Uh, may I ask one more question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Um, what is your what is your big dream right now? I mean, you are so accomplished. You have all these amazing projects. Do you see the next step for yourself? And if yes, would you be open to sharing? Yes, I have a book that I um, that I found that's an old book that was not written in English that's been translated that I think is would be really challenging. Like it's one of those things that I read it and I'm like, mm, that's really hard. That's real hard. That's real hard. Um, and it's one of those things that's just kind of buried into my soul and I have to do it. And I don't know if anyone's ever gonna agree or give me money to go make it. Um, but I just start the long process now of um, kind of trying to, you know, find writers and, and and talk to people that might be interested in making it um, and figure out what it is. Um, I also have a dream um, to be back on stage. Um, there's a play that is most likely being written. Um, and I think the subject matter is really interesting. And so that's at the very, very early stages um, that I'm producing. So I think, you know, I have it. I have some things that I think would be really challenging and exciting that I want to go do. And I'm also just, you know, an actor available to audition and hire. So I try to keep my dreams alive and in my back pocket, but know that um, I might have to wait on them a little while until it feels like the right moment where somebody wants to you know, it's like, put me in coach, like, where they finally going to put you in the hockey team, and then you get to score your goal. Exactly. And I, I'm sure you're going to manifest this, because if you are talking about this openly, the right people will come. Hope so. I hope so. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> now we have a question here from Eduardo Albertino. Eduardo, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Emmy? 
Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, actually, I, I am a pianist from Brazil. I'm a classical pianist, and I, I always think I learn a lot from from actors and actresses. And I'd like to know a little bit about, um, I'd say, the process. Maybe uh, technically speaking, because um, in my area, I deal with the challenges. Uh, for example, memorization, uh, how to memorize things long term. Uh, the difficulties of the stage every day is a different day some days we are not feeling well we are not so confident uh, we cannot focus a lot and uh, with your experience i'd like to know uh, if you can tell a little bit about this uh, how to how how is your process to work on a new new play or a new series a new role um, by the way um, I don't know if I express myself properly, but I'd like, if possible, if you tell, tell us a little bit about this. Uh, the biggest yeah. challenge for you about this, the process, memorizing things long term, how to keep this, because uh, in my case, for example, I deal with some uh, motor memory or muscle memory, and long term, we can't lose that. It becomes automatic. It, be, it becomes mechanic, and it's a danger for us to lose our con conscience on stage, you know? Uh, uh, do you go through this kind of challenge in your, in, your, in your work, in your activity? Could you tell us about this, please, a little bit? <laughs> I think I'm simultaneously confident and, like, not confident at all. Um, I'm confident that I've put a lot of thought into it, but I'm not always confident that it's going to work um, or that other people are going to like it. Um, but I think ultimately, you know, you're working, this is, you're not working in a vacuum, right? Like I'm not a solo pianist. I am one instrument in the orchestra, right? I'm one character or I'm just the director or just the producer. So this is really a team effort and it is really up to your peers and your director to reflect back at you if it's working or not. It's my job to do all the preparation. Memorizing for me is just a muscle. Like you go to the gym and the more that you do it, the more easy it becomes. And I think different people learn differently how to memorize. For me, I it doesn't matter what it looks like on the page, like that doesn't help me. I'm all by how it sounds. So I record this, the scene and I listen to it over and over and over. Um, and then I just do the other person's dialogue and I play stop and start on the voice memo recorder. It's very rudimentary. I don't use a program. I have like just voice memos of the scene and the other person's dialogue. And then I, you know, cover the, my dialogue and play their dialogue and, you know, go back and forth and make sure I got it right. And then I'll have somebody um, read it with me and just go word for word and make sure that I got it all right. There are also some directors that care if you're, or writers that care if you're absolutely word perfect and some people don't care at all. Um, but I like to try to be word perfect. Um, in term, that's the easy part though. Um, because that's just like kind of basics. Like you have to do that part. I think for me, it all starts with kind of an exploration if I have enough time or if I have the role or if I have a couple weeks with the audition, then I kind of try to do a psychological autopsy. I'm very intellectual about it at first. I break down where the person is from, what I think their upbringing was like. I try to find the secrets that are in the scene of what they're not saying or what they are saying. And then I try to let those things inform the rest of the story about the person that's not on the page. From there, I try to think, okay, what are the what are the ways in which this person is going about the world? How are they reacting in this situation? And how would I find those feelings in myself? Um, if I haven't had those experiences or haven't felt those things, I will try to generate those feelings or experiences in myself in a safe way. Um, 
right? I'm not going to go out and kill someone or do a whole bunch of drugs. Like there are other ways to experience things um, that are that are safer. Um, so that's kind of what I tried to do. And then after kind of intellectually thinking about it too much, I start kind of feeling my way through the text and, and kind of find my way through the scene. It's a really long process. Um, I'm not somebody who's a good cold read. My cold read is not good. Um, I'm like a good 570th read. Um, but I think, by the way, like, I just worked with Amanda Seyfried and Seyfried and, and she's incredible and, and, and is much more, um, kind of immediate and in the moment and, and doesn't put as much preparation into it. And she's brilliant. So everyone has a different way that works for them. Um, my way just works for me and has up until this point, but I think it has its drawbacks too. Thank you very much for that. Really interesting. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we have a question here from Jacob Smith from our LA campus. Jacob, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Emmy? Hey, Emmy. Uh, I'm a huge fan of yours, especially as Fiona Gallagher and Christine Daae. Um, if you could get a chance to play another Broadway musical character in a Hollywood adaptation, who would it be? You know, I have to admit, I am not that up on musicals as much as I should be. Um, I would probably have to go with operas because I know them so much better. Um, the role of Musetta in um, La Boheme has always been a personal favorite just because she's such a flirt and she's got that incredible aria Quando Men Beau that I've always loved since I was a child and I just think it's a great role. Um, not necessarily that I could pull it off, um, but I don't know. I, that's always one that's kind of like itched in the back of my mind of like, that would be fun. Thank you, Ami. Thanks. Well, we have a question here from Yas Sula. Yas, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Emmy? Hi, Emmy. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I just wanted to ask, because um, I can just imagine being a woman through such a volatile industry, what has your relationship been with your agency and autonomy throughout your career? What's that been like? Um, I mean, my relationship with my agency, I mean, I've changed agencies a couple times. I'm actually... Oh, back. I'm... I'm sorry. Uh, I should have clarified. I mean, um, like your personal, oh, um, my personal agency. Yeah, I mean, no more. Yeah, no problem. Um, I'm so sorry. That is incredibly embarrassing. Your question was so much more profound. I was going to be like, I think my agent's good. Um, <laughs> my agency. God, you know. Um, I think I have more and more found my voice. Um, I definitely didn't have it when I was younger and I was in situations that, um, that were not comfortable, that were not safe, where I was not protected, um, a lot of times, um, where I didn't feel safe to speak up. Um, and I've seen that happen to other actresses, uh, and I have stuck up for them and stepped in. Um, there were also other actresses that were older than me when I was younger who tried to step up for me and I was too scared and I wouldn't let them because um, I was too scared of the ramifications against me of speaking out against a producer who was being inappropriate with me. Um, so I think as I've um, found my way, um, I have my boundaries now and I feel much more confident to advocate for myself and be like, no, I don't think so. We're not, we're not doing this. That's not okay. And you're not going to do that. Um, and I'm not scared to voice a complaint anymore about safety, about, um, about, um, uh, inappropriate hugging or anything that still happens. So, you know, I think that it's tricky in our business because 
the kind of acting and the kind of work that we're doing is, it is intimate. It is really emotionally intimate. And I think that that leads people, whether or not they have malintent, to um, cross lines. And I think it's really, really important to listen to that little voice inside that says, like, me, 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 no, you know, and really kind of just, like, move away from that and say, like, even something as simple as, you know, uh, when I was directing something, somebody said, like, oh, you know, honey, you should just, the producer said, like, oh, you know, honey, if you just pick this other location, it'll be cheaper for us. And I was, like, inside, I was, like, cannot believe this person just called me honey. Like, I'm not your honey, right? So I took a moment and was like, what do I say? And I was like, you know what? I I actually prefer Emmy. And he was like, huh? And I was like, oh, you said honey, but I prefer Emmy. So I found a way to like hold my boundary without having, in that case, I didn't have to push back that hard, right? It wasn't like, hey, sweet buns, which would have been like, yeah, no, right? It was like, so I think that, that for every time that you feel uncomfortable or, there have been situations where people wanted to do stunts that just did not seem safe to me. And I wanted extra explanation about how it was gonna work. I wanted to see someone else do it before me. Like, I don't like heights and they really freaked me out and like I needed extra explanation. Um, So I think not being afraid to stick up for yourself in any situation that doesn't, just doesn't feel good, right? And like not being afraid to be like, I have to use the bathroom. Like it's been two hours we've been shooting. Like I actually need a moment. I think it's okay to ask for those things for yourself. And I feel more able to do that the older that I get. Also now having a daughter, I think about like, I think about what I want for her. And I try to treat myself that way, even though I think like I'm tough, I can take it. Right. Like I can stand out in 104 degree heat and like not drink for six hours and do a crying scene. Like, no, I can actually go in and like sit down and have a sip of water and take two minutes. Like, that's okay. I can do that. I'm not, that's not too much to ask. So I think it's carving that space out for you and and not being scared to push back in a way that's kind and dignified and in a way that still makes you feel good about how you conducted yourself. Thank you so much for answering that. Much better question than who's your agent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, we do have a question here. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Go ahead, Tobin. No, I said we'll edit this out. Don't worry. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a question here from Josephine Belling. Josephine, we've enabled you to unmute yourself. What is your question for Emmy? Hi, Emmy. I think um, this question was relatively touched on, but I was just wondering, um, like in Shameless, you were so raw in your character, and I was just wondering how you could get into that state of mind and try to forget that, you know, there's a camera just looking at you. Um, I generally try to, and I was just reading a, an interview with Kate Blanchett, which I thought felt like her both like losing herself in the moment and also kind of having 2% of her that was aware of where the camera was and playing towards it was kind of what I try to go for. I try to have like 98% of myself in it, but also like an awareness of what's happening around me Um, because that's kind of part of the craft, right? Like if I'm acting down here, like it's not, no one's going to feel it, right? So knowing how to kind of create a naturalism around moving towards a lens and not being scared of it, knowing that like, it's a good thing if the camera sees you, right? Even though it's like somewhat intimidating. I think now we're so used to having cameras in our faces and selfies and all these things that like, it feels easier than ever to kind of forget or just get used to the comfort of, you know, something capturing what's happening. Um, And I think that for me, um, you know, getting yourself to a a level of rawness and intensity really requires um, a lack of um, self-consciousness around how other people in the crew or the audience might view you. I have had snot fly out of my nose. I have hiccuped in moments when I, I, I just kind of, 
of course, I'm very aware that those things are happening, right, when they're happening. But I just keep moving through it because I feel like if they don't like it, they won't use that one, right? Or I'm not going to ruin it in case they do like it. Um, I think that it's also, like, not feeling scared to... I, when I was on Mystic River, I saw Sean Penn talk out loud to himself to get himself to an emotional state before the camera rolled. And beforehand, before seeing that as a young actor, I'd been very self-conscious about my emotional preparation and wanting those very personal stories that sometimes I use um, to be private, not to be shared, not to have anyone know my traumas and my sorrows. Like if I would talk to myself about how my dad wasn't around or how he, I thought he didn't love me. Or sometimes I would think about the Holocaust and all the kids and their faces. And I would say their names. I would just say it quietly in my head and it would get me to a place. But when I saw him do it out loud, I was like, maybe there's something to that. And I noticed that I wasn't viewing it as weird. I was thinking, wow, like how brave he doesn't care that he's having this experience in order to take himself to a place that that's what he needs to do for the scene. Like, he knows what he's doing. So I started doing that. And at first I was very self-conscious, right? Cause you're mic'd. So the director, the sound guy, like the person that's like the crafty can now hear like my childhood abandonment stories that I'm like whispering to myself or even funny things. Like sometimes, you know, if I have to laugh about something, I'll be like, you know, recounting a story. And for me, the release of getting it out makes it more powerful for me than holding it all in. When I was holding it all in, it was it became quite tight and I couldn't release it as much. So for me, when I found that I had this liberation to talk out loud, I, I don't make it anyone else's problem. It's quite quiet to myself, but because I want to respect other people's spaces and processes, right? I'm not like, by thought, like I'm not doing one of those, right? But like, I do think that there was something about liberating myself from feeling that other people would judge my process if they knew what my preparation was. Um, and so that for me offered a real opportunity to find my way to much more intense places um, without feeling like I was going to be judged. Um, and it's worked. No one has been like, you're weird, or that's dumb, or I can't believe you were hurt. And like, no one ever talks about it because they just know now that's something that I do. And I'll tell people, like, if I talk to myself before, I'm not talking to you. Like, I'm just muttering to myself. You don't need to address it. Um, but but I also tell the director, if that's happening, you can come up and talk to me. If you need to give me a note, you can take me out of it, and I'll go right back into it. Like, so I, I try to be flexible with my process, but also know, like, this is a tool that really helps me kind of get it out and not just kind of hold too tight. That's amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, I mean, I have one question that has come in a number of times from our acting students and aspiring actors that um, I'd love to pose before I turn this back over to Tova. Um, and it's uh, a very basic question, which is just, if you could only give one piece of advice to an actor who's just starting out, what would that be? Don't be scared. Great, easy. Um, Tova, I know that that um, you'd like to um, tie this up with- By the way, which never helped anyone. Though. Don't be anxious, don't be scared, never helped anyone. Though, but I feel like my note behind that is like, when you walk into casting, like they wanna find the person, right? Like it's their job to find the person. If they don't find the person, they're screwed. It's their job on the line, right? Like, so they want every person to walk in to be the person. They don't want to have to keep looking. They want to go to lunch and go home to their families. So I think that like, when you realize that like you walk into a room and like people actually really want you to win, it creates this like openness and this opportunity of like, you're not walking into this room where like people don't automatically think you suck. They don't want you to fail. They don't want you to suck. They don't, you know, so I feel like there's a lot of fear coming into it. And I feel like if you have that preparation and that kind of foundation underneath you of like, you know, the words and you kind of have an idea of what you want to do. I think, you know, you don't have to lead with fear, even though it's always there. Yeah. You know, Alec Baldwin was here 
and he said that at the beginning of his career he would go to audition and he would like say thank you thank you thank you and then it dawned on him that you're not really they're not really doing you a favor it's a business transaction they want you there mm-hmm. you're legitimately there right and right totally you know and therefore you know you look at it at that kind of a business exchange and it's like even And so with that kind of going in, you have a different kind of agency about yourself and a feeling about yourself, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. I think the rejection can also be so hard at the outset, but I've always told myself that, and this is something that I, like a mantra I've always held, is that every no is one no closer to the yes. Like it's just you're playing the odds. So at some point, someone's going to say yes. Like someone's going to be like, you're hired. Someone's going to give you a job. Someone's going to say yes. And like, there is a, there is like a momentum that builds, right? When you get one, yes, suddenly like m- maybe it's like the sixth, not the 10th job then. Maybe it's the fourth, not the, not the sixth. And so it starts to build. And I also think that when you get that, yes, that confidence that comes with that kind of comes with you into the room the next time. Yeah, it's like Carnegie, a famous thing he says, I know that a sale happens every 25 times. So every time I lose a sale, I'm very happy because I know I'm getting closer. Oh, yeah, I'm getting closer, yeah, 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 totally, yeah. So what I want to say, Amy, is um, one of the students just before said the correct word for this session And she said, fascinating. I really think that you gave us a very, very fascinating Q&A. I think that um, everybody learned something from it. I believe everybody that participated learned something from it. You were genuine. You were really um, caring. Uh, to give students tools and help them to navigate because it's different when you're in school and it's different when you go out into the world. And I think that you took care to, you know, um, give them the help that and the advice that they were looking for. I think it was worth waiting for. I hope so. Between the broken foot and then the and then the I had to go to work, but I really appreciate it. Thank you for waiting for me. Thank you. And thank you so so much for showing up for us thank and you. really giving us um, a glimpse into a working actress where people saw that you know you're not just afraid when you're starting out. You're more afraid when you're starting out. But basically, you know, all those experiences are challenges. And then you learn from them and then you get stronger. And then you have an arsenal of things to, uh, you know, to lean on later on. And I yeah. just think that it started fascinating and it ended up fascinating. And I thank you so, so thank much. You so much. And we will continue to um, cheer you on as you do um more and more project that you know you act in you direct in you sing and maybe dance even so there you go i've always wanted to play a ventriloquist so you never know (laughs) with amy you don't know the talent is enormous thank you so much much. bye-bye thank you bye